sickle cell metabolites, we wouldn't be having that specific pattern of haplotype represented in a single place, and also based on the pattern of migration within the African continent. And this was uh, later confirmed uh, last year uh, by uh, Charles Rotimi and, and Dan Schriner using a bioinformatic model. Uh, sickle cell have been known uh, at least for the medical fraternity for about one more than 100 years ago, first described uh, by uh, Dr. James Herikine, uh, African-American, specifically Caribbean uh, dentist uh, student. And uh, we call it sickle cell today because of uh, Mr. Lloyd, uh, that uh, German uh, uh, physician that uh, compare it to an instrument that was used in the Middle East in many places in, in Middle Age, many places in, in Europe, uh, as shown here. Uh, in the network in, in we, that we call the sickle cell disease ontology network, uh, where uh, I have met uh, uh, Kofi, we proposed a, a couple of years ago that it could be called also a banana cell anemia uh, that is adopted now as a synonym of sickle cell disease formerly in the sickle cell disease ontology. The sickle cell disease ontology is one of the projects that we drive. It's a project that aims to have a controlled vocabulary for all the terminology in sickle cell disease. It is an international project and on the middle uh, slide, all the people are uh, experts that we have consulted all over the world to get uh, uh, all the dictionary terminology that are present in the sickle cell disease ontology. It is a publicly accessible uh, ontology, so and uh, is reported uh, in the database, but as a journal, but you can see it on online. And this is a moving uh, dictionary. So every single year, there are a few words that can be added there. At the moment, it is the only and the largest ontology on hemoglobinopathy in the world with more than 1,300 words. I'm very privileged to speak today on sickle cell disease because it is by essence a condition that affects mainly people uh, in the African continent. For the 300,000 baby, estimate baby that are born every single year, 80% are born on the African continent. You all know the story between behind the malaria resistance and the sickle cell mutation that have made this condition particularly prevalent in all the places in the world where malaria have been endemic, and it is the case for most of sub-Saharan Africa. We are all aware of uh, how the disease pathophysiology works, and we single mutation uh, that allow the distortion of uh, hemoglobin, obstruction, and hemolysis, uh, the two key components of the pathobiology, and that leads to many uh, complications. Uh, I am also privileged to be part of a professional pedigree of a great researcher on sickle cell disease from Lilius Pauling that trained uh, Hek Kazesian that actually introduced for the very first time genetic diagnostic for sickle cell disease before birth. But the condition, as you know, have existed for some time. But over the past 40 years, for example, in places where the, the treatment is optimal, like in the US, the mortality in adults have not changed. So we have dropped the mortality in children, but not in adults. And these adults, uh, as some of you might know very well, they die on mostly on cardiovascular condition. They die of chronic cardiac condition, of chronic pulmonary condition, of chronic kidney condition, of and all of these cardiovascular complications of sickle cell disease are subjected to, to genetic predisposition, and I will speak to that a little bit later. A sickle cell disease, as you know, is a monogenic disease, but it's a disease that can also be influenced by environmental factor where you live, where you come from, your health system, your access to care, your access to medication, but it can also can be influenced by some of the genetic factor that we will speak to now. This is a general architecture of genetic disease. We have on one side rare diseases that are simple, that are monogenic, that are Mendelian, for example, cystic fibrosis. On the other side, common disease that are multigenic, that are complex, that are non-Mendelian, for example, diabetes mellitus. 
Uh, I like to convince you that sickle cell is the best of both concepts. It is a monogenic disease. It's not rare, it's common, at least in the context of African population. It is a condition by the influence of environment. If you are born in Nigeria or whether you are born in New York, your outcome might be very different because of health system. Uh, it is also a condition but many other genomic variation over the genome that affect the disease expression. How can genetics, knowing this, help sickle cell? The, the first and the most obvious one is to use genetics for early prevention that can extend to detection before birth. It is a, uh, a practice that we personally have introduced in Cameroon and in Cape Town about 10 years ago, but it's also a practice that pose a lot of uh, psychosocial and ethical issue based on uh, our experience with families uh, couple also based on a practical uh, um, research on qualitative research that we perform in at least three four different settings uh, that clearly shows that in the context of africa um, option for example reproductive option for termination is not something that is very much acceptable by many people uh, which uh, uh, prone us for example these are one of the early studies that we did a few years ago where we would show that these three different population or stakeholders, doctor, uh, parents or with sickle cell disease uh, children and patient themselves, if they all accept that the principle of detecting if a baby is to be affected with sickle cell disease is acceptable, uh, the attitude to termination was very different. Actually, only parents were in their majority uh, found termination acceptable. So we uh, move our focus uh, from primary prevention or rather to the secondary prevention with uh, the clear objective of looking for factors that can allow us to design predictive model, genetic predictive model for sickle cell disease. We all know that one of the strongest modifiers is the level of fetal hemoglobin. More fetal hemoglobin a patient will have, higher is the level, longer will be the survival. We also know that fetal hemoglobin is subjected to genetic variation. The most uh, common and the most popular one is a BCL11 one, a, a, a gene in which some variation uh, are associated with increased level of fetal hemoglobin. We confirm that in our population sample, for example, uh, from Cameroon and even a showcase that by using those variations, we could uh, predict uh, the hospitalization level uh, in this patient and in this specific setting. The second most strongest modifier of sickle cell disease that we speak less of is a uh, co-inheritance of alpha uh, thalassemia. Uh, for example, in this setting where there is no newborn screening, this was in Cameroon, that means that patient will show the condition uh, will only be diagnosed only when they start to show clinical manifestation. We took that as an opportunity to look whether we can investigate if this can be changed or the, the, the age of diagnostic can change in relation with the alpha thalassemia genotype. And, and we found that more deletion you have, later you will be diagnosed. And we suggested at the time that alpha thalassemia co-inheritance with alpha thalassemia and sickle cell disease could influence survival. And this had been uh, shown in a cohort study uh, performed uh, last year, uh, published last year in Kenya. That publication is Lancet uh, Global, Global Health. Uh, the, another modifier of sickle cell disease, a uh, modifier of uh, kidney dysfunction. We already know that alpha thalassemia modify kidney disease, sickle cell disease. Two other genes are ApoL1 and HMOX1. Uh, that changes uh, the hemolysis pattern in patients with sickle cell disease. There are also some other uh, genetic variation that can affect vasoclusive painful crisis in sickle cell disease. I must say this study is relatively difficult to do. This one that we reported was difficult to perform in the sense that the clinical definition of pain is not yet clearly uh, homogeneous in all the setting access to medication, uh, specifically opioid, that is part of the definition in some setting in the US could not be used 
in the context of the study that we have. And there are a lot of confounder behind the symptoms of pain. But despite that, we did use uh, the use of healthcare facility through consultation and hospitalization rate as a proxy and found a couple of uh, gene variants that could be associated uh, with pain and, and double check that some of those gene variants could also be equally associated with hospitalization rate or a consultation rate. But I must say, if we do not refine properly the definition of pain, the quality of pain, the quantity of pain, performing this type of study would be very difficult uh, now and in future. Another specific uh, uh, endophenotype of sickle cell disease that is affected by genetic variation is stroke. And already a long time ago, uh, there was an investigator that showed that a mathematical model can be used to predict the occurrence of stroke in sickle cell disease and much recently using transcriptomic uh, approach it has been shown that a stroke could be also a measure and patient can even be stratified according uh, to their transcriptomic to uh, possibility of a mortality. So in we, we could imagine that in future if we have more information of those variants that can affect uh, the occurrence of complication in sickle cell disease, it should be possible using a, a Bayesian model, a mathematical model to uh, predict from newborn screening which of the kids will need to have more aggressive treatment because they might be more prone for complication. Uh, lastly, genetic can help in sickle cell disease uh, because genetic can affect the way we treat our patient. Let's come back to uh, fetal hemoglobin. We now know for some time that if we uh, if we change uh, the expression on of some of the genes that modify the level of fetal hemoglobin, we can uh, cure sickle cell disease. This was a proof of principle in a mice model in which uh, B BCL11 was deleted and the mice was cured uh, for sickle cell disease. But BCL11 is a transcriptional repressor of sickle cell of fetal hemoglobin, which means that it's a control of the expression. More BCL11 you have, less fetal hemoglobin you will produce in terms of expression. But if you remove BCL11 in a patient, you will increase the level of fetal hemoglobin, but there are some consequences. And this has been shown a true natural experiment. They are actually patient from our dysmorphologic uh, clinic uh, that do have deletion that take away BCL11. Those patients, all of them have increased level of fetal hemoglobin, but they do also have uh, some neuro, uh, con no neurological condition, including some malformation. Uh, this discovery by Stuart Hawking, his group was very important, is still very important. They did show that there is an enhancer that control the expression of BCL11 only in red blood cells, so erythroid specific. In other words, if you manipulate BCL11, the consequence will happen only in red blood cells and nowhere else. Uh, if we summarize it, if we want to use uh, the knowledge that BCL11 control fetal hemoglobin to cure patient, we remove it using genetic approaches. You cure your patient because there's an increased level of fetal hemoglobin, but you will have neurodevelopmental abnormality. But if you rather control or modify the enhancer that is the, that is uh, uh, erythroid specific, you modify the expression of uh, BCL11, actually you decrease it, would lead to increase fetal hemoglobin in the patient and you cure your patient without the uh, unwanted consequence. And based on that, there are now a few experiments and also a few clinical trials that are underway by changing the expression of BC11 as a one of way to provide a definitive treatment for sickle cell disease. And also this will be the base for future of gene therapy. Genetic can also help understand some of the treatment, some of the modifier treatment that we have today. And the common example is hydroxyurea. Hydroxyurea seems to help patients, but how hydroxyurea works is not well known. 
Hydroxia also have a lot of complication, or at least a lot of side effect, not complication, uh, that allow uh, its impact to some time not to be a very uh, acceptable by some patients, at least from this part of the world. One of the research that we uh, are doing is to understand how hydroxyara works. And the idea is that if we could understand it better, maybe we may act on some other pathway that will have the very same effect without the side effect. We explore how hydroxyara work using uh, specifically uh, uh, erythropoiesis stem cell from the umbilical cord based on a model that we initially hypothesized and, and published. Uh, the way it works, uh, we have a uh, red blood cell uh, or, or blood cell from umbilical cord as cesarean C-section uh, from our local hospital here. And then we try to push stem cell toward erythropoid production as shown on the panel on the right hand side, top side, and try to check using a specific criteria if they have been differentiated into a red blood cell. When they are close to differentiation, we now uh, uh, expose them to hydroxyurea. And what we have done in this specific experiment we have looked at the expression of specific genes that are in the pathway of fetal hemoglobin, including BCL11A. And as you can see on the left-hand side top panel, exposure of hydroxyurea to erythropoid stem cell decreased the expression of BCL11A and uh, increased the expression, for example, of uh, uh, the um, gamma globin genes, uh, as you can see uh, clearly uh, in the middle. And, uh, but at the same time, there is a change in microRNA expression, the lower panel on the left hand side. And we also specifically show that a few of these microRNA, when they change, uh, they specifically target the expression gamma globin, the, the, as is shown on the uh, on the um, on the blot on the right panel top side. We propose this model of uh, action for hydroxyria that act through microRNA and a modified expression of a gene that promote a fetal hemoglobin and lead to the increased expression of fetal hemoglobin. Why is this important? This is important because if we know the number of those microRNA, we can imagine in the future packaging those microRNA as a new type of treatment. One of the limitations of this specific experiment, of this specific uh, study, uh, was the in vitro nature of the study. The second limitation is that we explore only seven microRNA. Uh, it might be possible that some of the microRNA that was not included could not be assessed with regard to their uh, interaction with uh, uh, fetal hemoglobin expression. We repeated the same experiment, this time in vivo. So we took a series of patients with sickle cell uh, disease, uh, some patients that were already uh, at the maximum tolerance uh, uh, drugs of hydroxyurea, some that was not on the hydroxyurea. This was the first experiment. The second experiment in the very same patient before administration of hydroxyurea, we took some blood and after administration of hydroxyurea, we took blood a little bit later when they were stabilized. And we measure now uh, more than 800 microRNA, experiment one and experiment two. And uh, those microRNA that was increased or decreased with the, with the exposure to hydroxyurea as shown on panel A and C, were now combined in a system model to know exactly where do they act. And we end up out of more than 800 microRNA to less than 20, the panel G on the right hand side. And that all clearly target uh, genes that are on the pathway of fetal hemoglobin and in particular BCL11A and MYB. So this in vivo study uh, clearly shows that microRNA are one of the best pathway in which uh, hydroxyurea uh, induce uh, the production of fetal hemoglobin. And it's our belief that once again, if we continue 
continue uh, this type of study, we will be at the end be able to have a library of microRNA that can be in future using appropriate technology given to patients to have the very same effect that hydroxyurea is having without the side effect of hydroxyurea. Let's stay on fetal hemoglobin and the genetics of fetal hemoglobin. We know that there are three loci that affect the expression of fetal hemoglobin. BC11A up to 14%, NYB region up to 7%, and the haplotype, actually the haplotype uh, influence uh, the expression of fetal hemoglobin just based on one specific SNPs, and that SNP is present in Senegal haplotype and in Indian Harap haplotype. But in combination, these three loci will explain up to 20% variation of fetal hemoglobin in the population that we have studied from Cameroon, from Congo, and from Tanzania, from Julie Makani, her studies. Where are the other 80%? That means that the missing heritability of fetal hemoglobin might be also one of the area that need to be investigated. Look for all the loci that can be targeted for new treatment for sickle cell disease. One of the limitation of the study that shows this on this panel was that those study was performed either in the USA amongst African Americans. Some of the study was performed on in European with beta thalassemia, and only one study was performed in Africa in Tanzania. The second limitation was that this study used a GNA array that was not purposely designed for people of African ancestry. As you may know, we are all African. As you may know, African ancestry, ancestral African, that they were like the ones speaking to you now, in their 300,000 history of human, uh, of, of human genetics evolution of modern humans. And which means that there are some variations that can only be found in ancestral African. There are some variations that could be more common in ancestral African because only a small portion of humanity moved from Africa about 7,000 years ago and, and colonized the rest of the world with just a small proportion of variation. What I'm trying to say is that we need to rerun this study by using a DNA array that is purposely designed to capture the depth of variation that is present on the African continent. Actually, recently, last year, there was a study in Nature that showed that at least 10% of variant that we have in African DNA is not present in the reference genome. This had been addressed like last year with design of this chip that includes 2.5 million variant designed through a project that is called Extra Africa a Consortium. And uh, this, uh, by the way, this is the variation that have been reported here will be published in Nature uh, next week. Uh, using that specific DNA array, we have run the fetal hemoglobin uh, genomics in uh, uh, population from Cameroon. Uh, the study I'm showing here should not be shared here. This slide, please, because it's not yet published, and uh, I will not speak a lot on on the result. But it's important that uh, it's not it shouldn't be shared. So what we have found, we have found we have replicated first of all uh, the what we already know uh, BCL11A. This is important modifier, but we have found at least three novel loci that could modify fetal hemoglobin. We have replicated three of the loci on African American. We have replicated two of the loci in population from Tanzania. If we combine the data that we have from the continent at the moment, we could explain up to 70% of irritability of fetal hemoglobin with this new study that we hopefully will be put on the market in a couple of months. If what we have found is true, if what we have found is correct, if it is the reflection of the biology and the reality, it means that they are very strong modifier of fetal hemoglobin that we could not have found if we do not perform these studies in ancestral Africa from Africa with the appropriate uh, technology. I will come to that a little bit later when we finish uh, this study. But one of the most uh, exciting studies I hope we have done over the past a few a couple of years uh, is that we have explored uh, what could be 
some of the genetic uh, variant that may explain long survival even on the African continent. Estimate uh, shows that if you are born in Nigeria uh, without appropriate treatment, you will uh, die before year five if you have sickle cell disease. You are in New York, uh, cell disease, your life expectancy will be up to 50s uh, with appropriate comprehensive care and even more. But in the context of Africa, we still have many uh, people living with sickle cell disease can, can live very, very long. One of them is one of uh, the professors of hematology that actually taught me hematology at the University of Yaoundé in Cameroon that he was about 50 uh, at the time. The question is, if you do not have appropriate treatment in environment where parasites like malaria are there, in environment where temperature is very high, in environment that is not necessarily tidy with regard to bacteremia, in an environment where you do not have access to hydroxyurea and any other basic care for sickle cell disease, and you still be able to live very, very long, one possibility is you might be as protected by some genetic factor. In the previous slide, we show in the very same context that if you have a double deletion of 3.7 uh, KB in the alpha globin gene, you will be diagnosed much, much later. Colleagues from Kenya show last year that with the very same double deletion on a newborn cohort, you will live longer. Why? We shouldn't imagine that there are some other variant in the genome that could do that. In this specific study, we took two extremes, what we call long survivors, and those long survivors were patients that were older than 40, living in Africa, that never have access to hydroxyurea on a consistent way, and that never have sex to repetitive blood transfusion. On the, the other extreme should have been patients that have passed away early, but we couldn't have that other extreme in the sense that there is no newborn screening. We took the second best, that was sickle cell disease patient, that have stroke early in life. And in the middle, we took a, a, a what we will call a random sickle cell disease patient that is younger than 40 and that never has stroke. And we use whole exome sequencing uh, to study all the 20,000 genes at the time. And our hypothesis was that if we have specific genes that have high effect, if they have deleterious mutation or mutation that are sub, sub, uh, uh, sufficiently powerful to lead to a very strong effect, we should be able to have them. We have a group that was the discovery cohort, sickle cell disease patient from Cameroon, uh, a proportion of them on Benin haplotype, a certain proportion of Cameroonian haplotype. And we have a replication cohort that was sickle cell disease from uh, Democratic Republic of Congo on a different haplotype. Most of them was on a Bantu haplotype. In the discovery cohort, we found about 41, exactly 49 genes that have repeat mutations, recurrent mutation uh, in these three groups. And we replicated 12 of those mutations in the, our replication cohort that was sickle cell disease from Congo. And these 12 mutations are presented in this slide here. If we take the extreme long survivor, the long survivor, for example, have a repeat mutation in genes like CLCN6 that was already well known to be associated to low blood pressure in African American, for example. They also have a repeat deleterious mutation in the second gene below that is important for the production of glutamine. In the other extreme, stroke, there was a recurrent mutation in genes that uh, include in blood coagulation and, 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 and uh, complement a cascade. And what we also found is that the two extremes did not share at all genes with recurrent mutation, while in the random group there were genes like those in the very central pink that were found in all the three groups. The second question that we ask, if we move beyond these genes 
and look at the pathway where they act, not their unique function, but their connection to the other genes in the body. What do we, what can we find? And these are the pathway associated with those variants, coagulation cascade, selenium nutrient network, blood clotting cascade, folate metabolism, vitamin B2 metabolism, complement meta uh, cascade, some of us will say there are some suspects here that could have been anticipated, like folate metabolism, like vitamin B2 metabolism that are involved in blood production. Some could also say maybe blood coagulation could have been anticipated because sickle cell disease, by definition and by pathophysiology, is, a hypercoag is in hypercoagulation state. But I must say, our surprise was to find that some of the genes are involved in glutamate and arginine metabolism. And we all know that L-glutamate is one of the medications that is not proof for treatment for sickle cell disease. Our interpretation is that there are some patients because of the variation that they have can produce enough glutamate endogenously to cure themselves, to treat themselves. And some of those patients whose variation keep their blood pressure very low, allow them to survive a little bit longer. You can notice that the nitric oxide, uh, NOS3, is also part of uh, the findings uh, that we uh, describe in this study. The third question that we asked was, let's let, let alone those variants that we qualify as deleterious, that actually can have a very strong effect and just look at those variants whose variation can be enriched in population of sickle cell disease compared to control. And the control that we selected specifically in this study were control that were hemoglobin AA. The reason was that there are more and more uh, literature showing that being hemoglobin AS may lead to some complications. We wanted to avoid that. And by doing that comparison, I will focus only on the first G diagram on the left hand side that represents unusual frequency, gene frequency variation in the group with stroke. Once again, we can notice serpent C1, that is a gene involved in, in the blood clotting. Uh, surprisingly, we notice one of leukotrien genes. Uh, that is called LTC4S is not important. The most important that this thing was already associated with respiratory problem in sickle cell disease, specifically asthma-like symptom in sickle cell disease. And variation in this specific gene seems to be uh, enriched in those with stroke. Of course, the next obvious question is to know whether if we perform the very same study in a larger sample size, this specific gene could be associated or could be linked to occurrence of stroke in sickle cell disease. And lastly, having a gene variant that potentially can be deleterious doesn't necessarily mean that it's actually linked to a function that may have an effect on the pathophysiology and the clinical expression. And the only way you could do it is to perform functional study through expression through protein production by showing evidence on function and potentially on the disease. We did not design our study for that, but there were some data in the literature that we interrogate to know if what we found makes sense. So by checking in the database, we did found a few uh, transcriptomic evidence that corroborate with what we found using the mutation screening approach. For example, enrichment is in starch and sucrose metabolism, enrichment in complement and coagulation cascade using a molecular profile risk in a few study, enrichment of oxidative stress that was classified at one of the top severity score in children eventually, enrichment of hem biosynthesis uh, in children. So what we found make sense. Why do we think this study is critically important? Actually, uh, just to tell you this, the story of the publication, when we sent this paper initially to the New England Journal of Medicine, 
uh, they immediately sent for review. The reviewer came back and said, oh, the number is not is small, the study is important, but the number is, is, is not big enough. We had the same answer uh, from the Lancet, uh, but uh, eventually uh, clinical uh, and translational medicine accepted it. But actually, we're going to prove both the Lancet and New England that they were wrong not to take the study. Uh, by doing the very same experiment, this time of about 2,000 patients of sickle cell, we are doing it now with all the required uh, uh, functional analysis, um, and, and we haven't seen the result that is different. So they, they might take it this time, but they, they have lost it already because uh, this other journal have already published it originally. So let's come back to the implication. The first implication is that by using this approach, we have confirmed some of the things that we knew. Coagulation, complement cascade are important. Uh, the genes that are involved in vitamin B metabolism and vitamin B6 are important. B12, B6, folate. What we may be uh, uh, approving uh, glutamate, L-glutamate for treatment and related arginine is a good move because the biology tend to tell us that based on what we found here. There are a few areas that would need some additional investigation. What is the role, for example, of selenium metabolism that would need a, a, a specific exploration? What is the role of starch metabolism that was found in transcriptomic, but also in the genetic study that we performed that would need some additional exploration? What is the role of uh, genes that are involved in the protection of cells, those, for example, involved in the protection of cell proliferation or hypoptosis that actually are usually associated with cancer, but we have found it to be enriched in some of the patients with sickle cell disease, as also evidenced by an independent study here using transcriptomic approach. Those are the new questions that we will need to ask. That because if those questions could point us First of all, new therapeutic approaches, maybe for, uh, some of the modifier genes, maybe one of the way to understand why we can uh, uh, involve our patient in specific uh, care that may allow them to have a better life. I hope to have convinced you that genomic and genetics can offer much more promise for one of the condition that affect most people on the African continent, whose uh, uh, um, impact globally is happening now because of migration and also because of beta care. And uh, I, I would like to thank you for your kind attention and thanks all the funders uh, that have allowed us to perform some of this work. Thank you very much. Thank you. <coughs> Ambrose, this was a fascinating presentation. Um, it's open now for questions. Okay, I can see Mercy. Thank you, um, Professor Wonkam, for very um, educative lecture. Um, I have always heard about XMN1 uh, gene, and I don't know whether it has another name that I probably didn't recognize it throughout this lecture. Um, if so, what role does he have? Uh, I've always known it in relation to HBF level. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, actually, the, the name that you have now is, is one specific variant that is present in uh, haplotype of uh, beta globin gene cluster or beta globin like, because actually in that cluster there is a lot of genes that are expressed according to our developmental stage. There are some that are expressed only uh, at the fetal stage. 
uh, some that express only postnatally. This variant is character characteristic of Senegal and Hinjam Harap haplotype. It's actually because of this variant that there is an increased level of fetal hemoglobin for those two haplotypes. But what we know is that in most populations that are not in uh, East Af East West Africa, extreme West Africa, like in Senegal or Gambia, uh, in most sickle cell disease patients, this variant doesn't exist. Actually, in the population that we investigated, only 1% of them have the variant. The reason why the level of fetal hemoglobin was relatively low. But actually, it's not the variant that is the most important in terms of a change in the level of fetal hemoglobin. BCL11A is the one that um, that is the most common. It's the one out of three patients will have the, a, a, the variant that can lead to change in fetal hemoglobin in, in BCL11A. Um, and, and there is a second variant that is much more rare in population of African ancestry in the MYB. Okay, um, is it Jossie? Yes. Ambrose, um, you will not recognize us because of the masks, but now you can see. I know, I can, I can recognize you very well now. <laughs> <laughs> And I still am, and I still and I still waiting for an invitation for that meeting in in Germany, so I can tell you that I recognize you. Okay. Um, the question I was going to ask you is whether you have been able to uh, identify, analyze the prospective uh, predictive value of these different genetic variants, um, so that we can get an idea as to what value what value they will have in a clinical setting, in a uh, in a young baby to predict what the what is expected of the disease? Yeah, that's that's a that is a fantastic question. Um, the, the, the short answer is no. Uh, the, and the reason why the short answer is no is that the only way you could do that is to do it on a on a cohort, on a prospective cohort. The, the best experiment to do that is to at birth for all these patients whole exome sequence them, all of them. I, I personally, I would prefer to go directly with whole exome. The a cheaper approach would be to select up those variants and genotype them and actually follow the patient for a certain number of time and see what are they, but you have to follow them in a very similar way in such a way that the factor of environment that is linked to healthcare access and treatment be the very same. And you could, according now to the model that you create, see if a combination of some of the variant will lead to a specific effect. And that would be the dream study to do. Uh, but that dream is not far away. And actually, we have established a network that we call Sickle in Africa uh, to uh, probe some of those models. The network at the moment had four countries. There is a coordinating center called SADAC that is under my leadership base in Cape Town. There is a six uh, four site, actually one in Tanzania, one in Ghana, and one in uh, uh, in Nigeria. Uh, at the moment, we already have eleven thousand in that uh, cohort, just as a proof of principle. We have applied for the renewal, and if we are successful for the renewal, I think we will be successful because we are that uh, good. I think, and next year we should be starting like a cohort study, but not on, on, not only on a subset of patients, maybe 500 per country because it's expensive to do cohort study. If that works, that's the perfect opportunity to, to explore those questions. And Ambrose, would you have a Western country as another fifth cohort uh, so that you can uh, identify whether the different environmental circumstances have a major impact? That, that, that's a great, that's, a, that's actually a great idea because actually you will compare the environment with many, many things. The first example would be the direct environment, the difference in temperature, the difference in wind uh, speed, the difference uh, in access, and, and the second would be the build environment, the access to care. Um, uh, and that, that would be the best design actually. It might be to have three different settings uh, with three different group of patients on the African continent have one group of patients in a good cohort in Europe and eventually have another group in, in, in America. Um, in principle, we should be able to extend the number of sites to five when we start uh, next, next year.
but it is not excluded that we might extend to to another side but the obvious uh, places in 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 brazil because the rich is part of the network and they could help have a comparative cohort thank you Hassan. i saw you <laughs> I'm sure Lono will be delighted to to help. Yeah. <laughs> Asad, I saw your hand up, but it's gone down. Do you still have a question? Asad. Sorry, I was on mute. I'm sorry about that. Um, th thank you very much for an excellent talk. Um, I mean, I think it was my question was uh, along the lines of Josu's really um, part, partly. Um, and it was just really how do you see this screening for genetic modifiers being implemented in routine clinical practice? And how do you think it might change the way that we manage patients with, with the knowledge with given the current treatments that we have available? Yeah, that, 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 that's uh, always the question that um, came to mind uh, when I speak specifically to patients. Uh, the question usually is that how do that change our life? It's, uh, it looks pretty, but how do that change our life? Um, my answer is that at this point of time, I don't think we are yet ready to use the genetic variant in implementation in clinical science. At this point of time, I, I do not think so. I, I, if I say we are ready to do it, I'll be lying. But I do think that some of those genetic variants may rapidly change the way we design new treatment. And, and the, the, one of the perfect examples of BCL11 is not a very long time that that was described. And as you may be aware that at least two patients have already been reported successfully uh, been a gene edit uh, using BCL11. Why is that we haven't moved more faster than we thought? I think there are many, many things that have happened. The first is that the cohort of sickle cell patients all over the world have been relatively modest because Africa has not been part of this research game for a very long time. And where the most patients are and where most of the study could have been accelerated have not been part of the major advance in the discoveries up to now. When I speak to my uh, American friend and colleague, they in their clinic, they have like 500 sickle cell patients, for example, like in Chicago, but their whole genome, their patient, like if like their life depend on it, because it is their only research currency. In Yaoundé, in my registry, I have 80,000 patients. What am I going to do with those 80,000 patients? I do believe if we increase the capacity in just in one or three or three settings on the African continent to perform some of those studies, we're going to accelerate the path of using genomics for prevention much more rapidly than we have seen now. But it's just now that it's starting, but we are not yet ready for it. Thank you. Thank you. So the next one I could see is um, Norris. Yeah. Um, yeah. Hi, um, hello, Prof. Wonkam. Thank you for the brilliant presentation. So you mentioned um, about the uh, sort of free QTLs, uh, uh, HBS1L MIB and, um, and BCL11A and XMN1, explaining about 20% of the variability. Um, and so you found some other genes that explain up to 80% of the variability, heritability of HBF. Um, are those new novel genes, are they, multi, are they multiple genes of small effect or one, one gene of uh, sort of large effect? Uh, it's, the, it's the first one. Um, first of all, it's not 80%. The combined variability that we have found is 70%, and those 70% include the effect of BCL11 and the other gene that was already known. Sure. Uh, but now there are multiple genes with small effect. There's sure. one particular that seems to have a very big effect, but the minor allele frequency is very low. Mm. So it, it seems to indicate that for those that will have those genes, and actually that one we, re, we replicated in amongst African American of the cooperative study, mm. but the effect size is even bigger than the one of uh, BCL11. Mm. Okay, wow. But the, the reality is that if I look at the minor allele frequency of BCL11, is about one third for the favorable uh, allele which means that we have designed a treatment that use that 
uh, a lot of patients will benefit from it, which will not be the case for the other variant. But having said that, we don't yet know the, the physiology behind the variant because it seems to be intergenic. Mm. Um, if we uh, investigate that a little bit more and understand, maybe the, the supplies might be in the other direction, might, might be somewhere else, but not necessarily in the variant, but what the variant cannot do. So the, the, the minor, the major alert frequency. So we still need to investigate more in terms of function to understand what it means. Thank you very much. Lola? You're mute. Mute. <laughs> Thank you for an interesting lecture. Um, like your patients always say to you, what will this mean for me and my, and my health and my life? What difference will you make? Because we're only thinking in terms of the various African countries and the economic problems uh, associated with healthcare. You know, how do we get over the obstacle? All this research is wonderful if the outcome is, you know, people can't afford the medications or the drugs or, or the treatment or the, gen, or the gene therapy or whatever it is that we are, you know, researching and finding and able to offer them. All these countries, we're talking about quite a lot of countries that are quite poor. So how do we then, you know, translate that into impact? <laughs> I'm not, I don't come from the scientific background. I'm coming from the human perspective. So I, I do think your question is very much welcome. My simple answer to it is that science and norm will not save us or will not save Africa. But without science, we will not be safe, certainly. So that's the best answer I can give. The second best answer is that when um, the diarrhea was found to be one of the most challenging things in pediatrics, for example, one simple fundamental research that no one ever knew what it would lead to helped save many, many millions of kids of diarrhea in the world. The knowledge that if you pull together a molecule of sodium and a molecule of glucose, you help the reabsorption of sodium easier. Was a fundamental research that at the time no one knew the utility, but ultimately was used massively in public health. So that's the, the, the second point. So what we looked at those questions, our question is not necessarily to throw an arrow in a target that we already seen, but to throw an arrow and draw the target around. So if we find something, we're now trying to probe what does this mean? I will take just one simple example. I was explaining to one patient support group that was exciting about the result and he said, what does that mean for me? There is, for example, what we found that selenium metabolism seems to favor survival. I have no idea what it means, but what we could do is to look for those food that we already have in our diet that may be rich in that specific nutrient. Is, uh, and I don't know if it's the way to go, but nutritionists will tell me if it is the way to go. What we know is that lowering your blood pressure is important. We know there was a relative low blood pressure in patient already. Let's keep it low. That would be simple things to do already as the outcome of the study. The glutamate and uh, arginine as treatment, we all know that they are not essential amino as in the sense that they are produced by the body. Can we make sure we accelerate those production without giving a specific treatment? Those could be one of the implications. But when we look at those type of research, our question is not immediate. Our question is, is to have a command on our future by doing the research ourselves. Very good, thank you. Um, I can't see any other questions at the moment. Any other hands raised up? No. So in the absence of that, I would say a big thank you to Ambrose and with all the difficulties and we appreciate your time for a very excellent presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Kofi. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Bye. Everybody have a good weekend.